Anyway, now that we've restarted the notes, that was such a good beginning, too. So what I was saying is we're going to start digging into polynomials that have degree higher than 2. So third degree, fourth degree, fifth degree, sixth degree, yada, yada, yada. And eventually, by the end of this unit, we will know how to... Now I'm getting a phone call. What in the world is going on today? Uh, anyway, God, what? I don't even know where I was. Strangers trying to enter the waiting room. Randos calling my cell phone. I have no clue what's happening today. Okay, look, by the end of the unit, but yes? Did you ever find out the culture in prison the way you were in Nah, it could be any ding dong from all over the day because I remember now that um, all of my classes have the same stuff. I don't change it for anything. So it could have been any class. Anyway, by the end of this unit, you will be able to solve and graph polynomials with really, really big exponents on them. All right? So we've already talked about all of this stuff about uh, polynomials before. A term is one, any one of the objects that's separated by the pluses and minuses. Uh, the coefficients are the numbers that sit in front of that variables. The biggest exponent is the degree of the polynomial. And the leading term, meaning the term that has the largest exponent in it, has something that we call the leading coefficient, the number on the very, very front, and that's really important to us. And we know that standard form is written in the correct order. That means from the biggest exponent down to the smallest exponent. That's all review. So what we do is we start by talking about transformations and how these things relate to a quote-unquote parent function of the form a n times x times x to the n. Now, I am going to disagree a little bit with the authors here. Again, I mean, you know how I like to do that. I like to argue with the people who write the textbook. This a sub n, I don't think that should be there because a parent function should not have a number on the front of it because a number on the front is a vertical stretch or shrink. So the parent function that they, we would be, uh, the parent function we'd be referencing for this one is x to the third, the parent cubic. There are two transformations on that parent cubic that would give us g of x. What does that four on the front? What does that do? Vertical stretch, and somebody else said factor four. Yep. So vertical stretch, factor four. I don't feel like writing the word stretch. And what about that x plus one on the inside? What does that do? Shift left one unit. But what are we shifting left one unit? I mean, I know, I know we're shifting the whole graph, but you know, if this is a parabola, we'd be, we'd be tracking that vertex, right? Okay, cubics, x to the third graphs, they don't have a vertex. Some of them have another type of point. You could, you could imagine that the cubic centers around that point. So the quote unquote center of our cubic has been shifted to the left one. Well, if it was the parent function, it would have been at zero, zero, right? So now it's at negative one comma zero. That's right here. And I believe we were told to compute the y-intercept. Okay, let's do that. Well, y-intercept, if I'm on the y-axis, what do I know? Anytime you're on the y-axis, what? Your y is x is zero, yeah. Anytime you're on the y-axis, x is zero. So let's find out what f of zero is. By plugging in zero, let's see. Well, that's going to give me zero plus one is one, and one cubed is one times four is four. Oh, our y-intercept is at zero comma four. Okay, that is right here. So I know what's happening one unit to the right of the quote unquote center. I should probably plug in negative two so I can go one unit to the left of the center just to see what's going on. Let's say, okay, let's, let's plug in negative two, and you don't have to actually show the work. You can just do it verbally. Okay, if I'm dropping a negative two right here, negative two plus one is negative one, and negative one cubed is negative one, and negative one times four is negative four. So when I'm at x equals negative two, I'm at y equals negative four, And this graph has this shape. So that thing in the middle is not called a vertex. 
Its technical term is an inflection point, but it's kind of hard for me to describe what that means. So for now, I'll just call it the center. But it is the inflection point. Anyway, that person is never getting in. Good try, though. It said, I'm the new person trying to get into class or something like that. And they're never getting in. They could just, they could just forever sit in the waiting room. Enjoy purgatory, new student. All right. That was, that was really simple. Let's do the next one, which is a fourth degree polynomial, a quartic, if you want to know what they're called, a quartic. Now, every fourth degree, sixth degree, eighth degree polynomial, these things are technically all considered quadratics. So a quadratic is any polynomial whose degree is even. Now, you don't have to know that, but yeah. So what, what is it shaped like is the question. Well, all quadratics want to be shaped like parabolas. Now, they can end up with more wiggles in them. They can. But the parent quartic, f of x equals x to the fourth, looks just like a quadratic, just like a regular old parabola, except it's a little bit flatter on the bottom, just a little bit. The bigger that exponent gets, 6, 8, 10, 12, the flatter, quote unquote, the uh, bottom becomes. It starts to widen out before it shoots up to the sky. No, it's impossible. Okay. Now, I see three transformations. Three transformations on what would have been the parent quartic, the negative sign on the front. What does it do? It's a reflection over x axis. So that negative sign on the front is a reflection over the x-axis. So now we know that this parabolic shape points down. And the minus 2 on the inside? Ah, shift right 2 because inside opposite. And then the plus 5, that one's obvious. And then shift up 5. So what we have here is what would have looked like a parabola, just a little bit flatter on the bottom. It's been turned upside down. It's been shifted to the right two and up five. So it's vertex, and this is a vertex, right two, up five, points down. And all we need to do is compute our y-intercept. So plug in zero for x again. Uh-oh, look at this boo-boo I made. I didn't plug into F. I plugged into G. Whoops. I caught it. Okay. H of... And this is me just plugging in 0 for X. Well, negative 2 to the 4th power is 16. But this is negative 16 plus 5, which is negative 9. So we're crossing the y-axis at negative 9, negative 11. I can do math. Negative 11. There we go. Which is here. Well, because this is basically the quote-unquote vertex form of the because this is vertex form of that fourth power, it does technically have an axis of symmetry. So we can just reflect that point that's on the y-axis over to here and connect our dots and try to flatten it out a little bit. Whee! Like that. Something like that. You get the idea. Okay, well, that's easy, right? That's really, really easy. So transformations. Nice thing about transformations is that they're true for every single function. It doesn't matter what the function is, transformations are always going to be done exactly the same way. Now, to be honest with you, I don't really understand what the authors were getting at with this question with these two questions. So I'm just going to kind of do them the way I want to. It says graph the polynomial function, locate its extrema and zeros, explain how it's related to the monomials from which it is built. I'll be real with you. This explain how it's related to the monomials part is kind of it's kind of iffy. So we're not even going to bother with that. 
And locating the extrema, yeah, you would just use your graphing calculator for that. You know, the second trace max or the second trace min. What, that's not going to be on your test, so I'm not going to be doing that either. Because you can't use your graphing calculator for my tests, right? Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sketch the graphs, find the zeros, and just look at them because they're going to be important to me in a moment when I talk about future stuff. This first one, it factors. I have X as a GCF. Okay, well. Anytime there's an X on the outside of the parabola, parabola, anytime there's an X on the outside of the parentheses, what is its solution there? Zero. Yeah, so the X that's sitting outside is telling me that my graph crosses the X axis at zero. And what about X squared plus one? Is it one and negative one? Is it one and one? Ah, I, there we go. You see, X squared plus one is always a positive number. It will never equal zero. So there are no solutions for x squared plus one. I mean, graphically, if you're not sure why, it's because it is the parent quadratics, but it's been shifted up one unit. It never touches the x-axis, okay, obviously. So what does this whole graph look like to us? Well, we know it crosses at zero, zero. And we're smart cookies. Let's just plug in x equals one and see what happens. And we'll plug in x equals negative one to see what happens. Let's plug in one, okay. Let's plug in one. One squared plus one, that's one. Two, good Lord. One squared plus one is two, there we go. Times one is still two. Two. When x is one, y is two. There you go. And if you plug in negative one, well guess what? Negative one squared is one. One plus one is still two, and two times negative one is negative two. So this graph looks pretty darn similar to the parent cubic. That's not identical, but it's pretty similar though. We found it's one zero at x equals zero. Guess how many extrema it has? None, it has no extrema, zero. It doesn't have any maximums or minimums, okay? And then it says, we're supposed to re explain how it's related? No, no, let's not, let's just not, because it's weird. Now this next one, x to the third minus x, that is a little bit different. When it factors and you pull that x off, what you get is x squared minus one, and that does factor. That is the difference of two squares x squared minus 1 factors to x plus 1 times x minus 1. Suck it in parentheses. We can make it in there. That one has three zeros. At x equals 0, x equals negative 1, and x equals positive 1. So we can sketch that bad boy. So we got that going on. And what do we know? We know that cubics, as long as they haven't been flipped upside down, as long as they haven't been reflected over one of the axes, and this one we see has not been reflected because it's positive on the front, we know they're going to have the same general shape as this one on the left. And that general shape, that general shape is they go down and, whoa. They go down and to the left, they go up and to the right. That's the general shape of a cubic. So in between, it's going to have to do this. It's the only way that you're going to hit all three of those numbers. So we've got some more wiggles. Now, the authors did want us to find the local extrema. We found the zeros. They're at zero, positive one and negative one. The authors wanted us to find the local maximum. That's between zero and negative one. And they wanted us to find the local minimum, which is between zero and positive one. But you won't be able to do that without a graphing calculator until I teach you calculus. So we're not going to do that because I can't ask you to do that on my test. That's good enough. That makes me happy.
If you do that in the homework, woot, you're set, okay? Hmm. Here's a really neat fact down here in this box. It says, if you have a polynomial that is degree n, meaning a fourth degree polynomial, fifth degree polynomial, whatever you want the degree to be, there is at most n minus one local extrema, and at most n zeros. So a fourth degree polynomial can, can have three local extrema and four zeros, up to. It's not always a guarantee, but it's possible. And that should be pretty obvious. I mean, what, a parabola is degree two, it has one minimum max, and it has two zeros, well, up to two zeros. Should be pretty easy. Neat little fact. The last thing that I want to talk about today, the most important thing that we're going to talk about today, is end behavior. You should have learned about end behavior in Algebra 2 Honors. End behavior is talking about what is the graph doing to the far left and the far right, yeah? Question's, question's not broken. Reload the page if the picture's not showing properly. So you should have learned about this in Algebra 2 Honors, and what we're talking about is what is the graph doing to the far left and far right? We've kind of already talked about that. Now, hold on, i got to go fix Kai's test. Now, we've kind of already talked about the far left and the far right of a graph before. We talked about the far left and the far right when we were talking about end behavior asymptotes, or horizontal asymptotes. Well, what happens if they don't have a horizontal asymptote? What are they doing at their quote-unquote endings to the far left and the far right? Well, what we're talking about when we say to the far right is we're talking about the limit as x goes to negative infinity, and limit means what are the y values doing? So limit as x goes to negative infinity of f of x, mathematicians read that as as x heads to the left, what are the y's doing? And you could say they're going up, they're going down, or they're crashing towards a number. And this one says, as x goes to positive infinity, what are the y values doing? That's what that says. Now, depending on which teacher you had for Algebra 2 Honors, you may have seen, seen the end behavior dance. And it's a shame that this doesn't actually make it onto the video, so this is for your eyes only, I guess. End behavior dance is like this. Both up, both down, one up, one down, right? Anybody's teacher ever show you that? In behavior dance? Like that? Now I have to be careful, I have a bad shoulder, I can hurt myself. And no joke, I hurt myself some years ago doing that. I did it too fast. And uh, I have a bad shoulder and it was bad. But, but it is, it, it is a very important concept. You should have mastered it, mastered it in chapter four of Algebra 2 Honors, and it works like this. Anytime the degree of a polynomial is even, and not even symmetry, I'm talking about the degree, is anytime the largest exponent is an even number, both the left and the right side of your graph will point the same direction. So think about a parabola, x squared. Positive people smile, negative people frown. So anytime the biggest exponent is even, positive number on the front, Left and right go up, negative number on the front, left and right go down. Now, if the degree of the polynomial is odd, and we're not talking odd symmetry, we're talking about an odd degree polynomial, it's one up, one down. How do you remember that? Well, I always tell the algebra two students, like, don't I look odd doing this? You know, and again, it's a shame you can't see me flinging my arms around in the air in the, in the video, but, you know, you get the idea, hopefully. That's what odd looks like. <laughs> But which one is which, right? Well, the parent cubic, the parent cubic looks pretty much like this top left graph. You see how its left is down and its right is up? See that? Well, anytime the exponent, the biggest exponent is odd and the front is positive, the left will go down and the right will go up. If the front number is negative, it reflects over the x-axis, so to speak, the left would go up, the right would go down. Rather than strictly memorizing that, let's look at these images here. Let me grab my red pen and show you. If I could connect the endings of the graph with a straight line, what could you tell me about the slope of that straight line? It's positive. 
That's because the front number is positive. Because over time, its average rate of change is positive. And that's why this thing says the front number is positive right there. And obviously over here, if you were to connect the endings, what we have is a straight line whose slope is negative. It's going down over time. Its average rate of change is negative because the front number is negative. So what's going on with the dotted lines in between? The spaghetti, I like to say. The spaghetti that's happening between the endings, we'll get there, OK? We will get there. Today we're focusing on the end behavior. The spaghetti in between, well, you're going to need to know where it crosses the x-axis and things like that. And the last two examples are showing you even uh, degree polynomials. See both endings up or both endings down. Positive people smile, negative people frown. And the limit notation is just describing what the y values are doing as the x is head left, or describing what the y values are doing as the x is head right. That's all the limit notation does. We'll get into we'll get into limit notation a lot in quarter four. Yay, calculus. So these are the exact same two examples we had a moment ago, but we've been told to do something different. But I do want to alter one of the questions just to make it better. So I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to scribble out this exponent of 3, and I'm going to change it to a 4. There we go. Now it's a better question. We've been told to describe the end behavior using limits. It says then use a grapher to graph the polynomial in a window, show its extrema and zip. No, no, yuck, no, not doing any of that. Because you can't do that without a graphing calculator until you know calculus. So what we are going to focus on is strictly the end behavior. That's what I want you to do in your homework. Focus on the end behavior. Okay? If it's a, if it's a graph you can easily sketch, go for it. But I don't want you trying to track down maximums and minimums right now. That's not what I care about right now. Right now, end behavior. So this first one, the degree, is the degree even or odd? And the leading coefficient, positive or negative? Positive number, it is positive 1. So since it is an odd degree polynomial and the leading coefficient is positive, our endings look like this. Left down, right up. That's what our endings look like. Spaghetti in between? Who cares? Not important right now. What we're going to do now is describe those red things with limits. The limit as x goes to negative infinity. What are the y values doing? That's what this says. This says, hey, what are those y values doing as x goes towards the negative numbers? That's all that says. So you look at the red arrow to the left, because that's where x's are going to the left. And what are my y values going towards? Yeah, they're going towards negative infinity, because they're pointing down. And the limit, I'm going to squeeze it in there, as x approaches to positive infinity of f of x, that says, hey, what are those y values doing as x's go to the far right? Well, that would be the right arrow. It points up. So where are they headed? Positive infinity. There you go. Now, the next one I changed. I changed the uh, degree because I just want to talk about in behavior. It is now x to the fourth minus x. I don't care where its zeros are. That's not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not caring. Instead, what I want to talk about in behavior, what I want to talk about is in behavior only. The degree of this polynomial, is it even or odd now? Even, ooh, okay. And my leading coefficient, positive or negative? Positive. It's positive one. So because I have a positive leading coefficient with an even degree polynomial, positive people smile. This is both endings up. Left up, right up. Spaghetti in between, who cares? Not important. I can tell you I know this thing has two zeros. I know that. It crosses the x-axis twice, not three times. 
And I can tell you those two times are at one and negative one. No, one is for sure, oh, one and zero, that's it. They cross it one and zero, and that's it. But I don't really care, not really that important. Let's talk about the limits, and we will be finished for the day. So the limit as x approaches the negative infinities, what is the y value, what are the y values doing? So what are the y values doing as x goes to the left? The y values are increasing, but they are approaching infinity because they point up forever. Now let's see what those pesky y values are doing as x heads to the far right. As x goes to the right, what are my y values doing? Oh, they're going up. They're increasing again to positive infinity. Cool. There you go. That is it for today.